And the Bible says in 1 Peter 4 that when you judge yourself, that is the proof, if I'm paraphrasing it, that you're part of God's house. Judgment must begin at the household of God, 1 Peter 4, 17. And if it begins with us first, what's going to be the condition of those who do not obey the gospel? So to use an illustration, if you put a cube of ice in a glass of orange juice, you can see only 10% of that piece of ice, the part that is above the surface. 90% of that cube of ice is below the surface. Now, if you take a knife and you slice off that top 10% of that cube of ice and throw it away, what will happen to the cube of ice? You know what will happen. A little bit of that underneath 90% will come up. 10% of that 90% will come up above the surface. And then you take a knife and slice off that also. Some more will come up. That is how God gives us light on areas of our life that are initially hidden. If I deal with the areas of my life that I know are wrong, then God will give me light on the areas of my life where I don't have any understanding of what is Christ-like. That is spiritual growth. It's this cube of ice getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Nobody has ever got rid of the cube of ice fully on this earth. Nobody's ever become Christ-like, not even the Apostle Paul. But, I'm sure the cube of ice in his life had become pretty thin as he had responded to whatever light God gave him. In one place he says, I do my best, Acts 24, verse 16, to keep my conscience absolutely clear with God and with man. It was one of the great secrets of his life. As he got light on some new area, he repented of it, sought cleansing. So we see that is the way of spiritual growth, repentance constantly. The other thing I want to say about repentance is that repentance should primarily deal with inward sin. One big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is this. The Old Testament emphasized everything external. The New Testament emphasizes everything internal. For example, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were external on the altar. In the New Testament, the sacrifices are internal, inward. In the Old Testament, the temple was outside in Jerusalem. In the New Testament, the temple is inside. God lives in here. This is the temple of God here. In the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments dealt primarily with sin which was on the outside. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6, Jesus spoke about the sin which is on the inside. That's one of the big differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, they were holy on the outside. In the New Covenant, God wants us to be holy on the inside. And in the Old Covenant, in the Ten Commandments, as you read in Exodus chapter 20, out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them dealt with the outside. It's all listed in Exodus chapter 20. We were not, we were not to take, we're not to have any other gods. We're not to make idols. We're not to take the Lord's name in vain. We'll keep the Sabbath day holy. And those, uh, the first four, and then honor your father and mother, five, 
Don't murder, six. Don't commit adultery, seven. Don't steal, eight. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor, nine. Notice it doesn't say don't tell a lie. There's no commandment in the Old Testament like that. It's a too high a standard. But when you go to court and you try to swear something, make sure you don't tell a lie there and bear false witness against your neighbor. A lie is a sin, but they couldn't get victory over it in the Old Covenant. It's a sad thing that many Christians don't have victory over it. But notice, all these nine commandments were relating to the external life. But when it came to the tenth one, God put one commandment right at the end to test how many people would be sincere and honest. That commandment said, you shall not desire your neighbor's wife. He's not talking about grabbing your neighbor's wife. No, 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 you're not touching her. You're just sitting in your home and thinking about her, desiring some thing that belongs to your neighbor that's not yours. It could be your neighbor's wife. It could be your neighbor's house. It could be your neighbor's daughter. Every woman on this earth is either your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's daughter. Sure. And the Bible says you're not to lust after a woman that's not your wife. So, here is a command which no man could keep. You shall not lust. Nobody could keep it. The Apostle Paul in one place says, according to the righteousness in the law, Philippians 3, he says, I was blameless. But the same man says in Romans 7, that when it came to the last commandment saying thou shalt not covet or thou shalt not lust. I found all types of lusting and coveting in my heart. He's just being honest. That's the difference between Paul and many Christians. Paul was absolutely honest. He said I found all types of coveting in my heart. And I couldn't overcome it. I just cried out oh wretched man that I am. You read that in Romans chapter 7. Why did God put that 10th commandment there, which he knew that nobody could keep? Because he wanted to test after people had kept the nine commandments to see whether they would be proud like the Pharisee and say, Lord, I thank you, I'm not like other men. Or whether they'd be humble like Paul and say, oh Lord, I just am not able to keep this 10th commandment. I'm lusting and coveting and lusting and coveting all the time. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall set me free? It's quite different spirit from the spirit of the Pharisee. And those are the ones whom God sees crying out in defeat of the 10th commandment, whom the Lord will lead into something higher, which is the new covenant, a life of victory over sin. So, that's the reason why the 10th commandment was kept there. You remember when the Lord spoke to the rich young ruler. He told him only about the commandments up to commandment number 9. He never told him the 10th one. He start, he, I mean the commandments had to deal with first of all the first four were dealt with God. The remaining six with man. And Jesus took the ones dealing with man and just listed five of them. Don't murder, Luke 10, 19, sorry, Mark 10, 19. Don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness and don't honor your father and mother. So that's five. And he said, I've kept all of these. And then the Lord spoke about the 10th one. He said, what about all your love for money? Go and sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and then come and follow me. Then we discovered that he had not kept, he didn't want to keep the 10th commandment. So the Lord kept that 10th commandment there to test people's sincerity and honesty. Paul was sincere and honest and said, I found I couldn't keep it. I cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me 
And he says, thank God through the Lord Jesus I can. And he goes on to describe in Romans chapter 8, the next chapter, how the law of the spirit of life set him free from the law of sin and death. So as he got light, he repented. As he discovered some new area of lust in his heart, he confessed it to God and said, Lord, this is wrong in my life. I want deliverance from it. And wherever God sees a person sincerely acknowledging a sin and taking it seriously, wanting to be free from it, crying out to God for grace to be protected, he gets victory. He gets the power of the Holy Spirit to be an overcomer. Repentance, true repentance, leads to an overcoming life. It says about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, He who never sinned, he in whom there was no sin, was still tempted as we are. Hebrews 4.15 says that. In every point, how did he overcome sin? His is an example for us. Hebrews 5, 7 says he cried out with loud cries and tears and prayed to the Father to save him from death, which is to save him from spiritual death and sin. And he was heard, his prayers were heard because of his godly fear. And so we see that this is the way for us too. If Jesus never sinned, it's because he was so serious about fighting temptation, praying with loud crying and tears. And if we pray in the same way and cry out to God, we will experience the same victory that he experienced too. If we are defeated, it's because we haven't taken sin seriously. May God help us all. God bless you.